We are farmers. Well, it's uh, what we did. This this is intended to be an aerodynamic dragster, and it was designed in collaboration with a fellow named Kent Kelly, who designed the GM1 tunnel, and an engineer that worked for him who had done some dragsters, and it was going to have a tubular chassis and uh, chassis frame. And this would be a very lightweight body shell, probably made out of very thin fiberglass. That was the best thing we could come up with at the time. Uh, sheet metal might have even been lighter, but we I, th I think we sell them fiberglass because this would be a one-off car. The uh, ideas in this are to try to in decrease the aero drag, the passage of air over the car, decrease the resistance from aero drag way beyond what a regular dragster would be. So that while this dragster would be a f maybe, is, I don't know, a few pounds heavier than a standard dragster, uh, which had the driver at the back. Uh, they call them slingshots because he sat at the back and looked out over the engine and so on. And the rear wheels were out at the same tread as the front. Uh, this, piece, this vehicle would be heavier, but because it had so much lower air resistance, somewhere around the 100 mile an hour uh, range when it got up that on its way to maybe a lot faster than that, uh, it would pass the other dragster because it would be so much less resistance as it got faster. So you, right off the line, the other dragster would be, would be ahead of this. But at some point, this baby would go ahead, past it like it was standing still because it was so sleek and aerodynamic. The layout then was a big part of it. Um, the engine now is ahead of the rear wheels. This is the exhaust coming out. Ahead of that, you can just see these lines which make a bulkhead. It was going to be a big tubular hoop. And then the driver is almost lying on his back uh, in front of that with his feet out in the direction of the front. These twin booms out there house the uh, torsion bar suspension. Each torsion bar lays in one of those sort of bomb shapes. And then the, there's a sort of a blade-like uh, axis going out from there to these jacketed wheels. The wheels are very skinny, like bicycle tires, but they're fully jacketed. So they act like canard aircraft fins. They, they actually add uh, to the steering, uh, the aero steering at high speeds. Uh, not that they need to be, but they, this, this is, was a way to do that and get rid of the resistance of the spokes and the spinning wheel, which had a lot of drag. So the driver's lying on his back with his, looking out this sort of panoramic windshield, uh, which is made out of very thin, probably plexiglass. And the air is passing as the air passes over the vehicle. It, it's, this is a, what they call the NACA scoop, N-A-C, it was developed for jet planes. It's a scoop that sucks air in to the supercharger, which is behind the axle. Then the, then the axis that comes off the engine, you can see right, ab would come off right above those, uh, would come off the back of the engine and drive back to run the supercharger. And the air would be sucked in and feed the engine. So it's a supercharged engine or at least partly supercharged. This is full of other little details. There's a parachute that pops out of the back. There's a flap right there that goes up if we're getting too much rear end lift, which we might. So we have those. This is a, a small block Chevrolet, the pattern of those. Uh, and we were going to put this in the tunnel. Uh, Kent Kelly, who, had, who was the chief tunnel guy in those days, and is still one of the great geniuses of automotive aerodynamics, Kent uh, was going, well, we were going to put this in the tunnel. Chevrolet had rented a tunnel in, in the Volte Tunnel in Texas. The Volte was an aircraft firm from World War II, and they had a tunnel in Texas that was pretty good. It had a pretty fairly good sized throat, so bigger cars could, and models like this could be handled easily. And we were going to put it in the tunnel under a Chevy, Chevy's rental arrangement, where it, after two o'clock in the morning or something, we could run this guy uh, and still get it on the Chevy budget. But about a week or 10 days before we were scheduled to 
go down there and take it in there. This is, a, by the way, an aerodynamic model. It's made of plaster and has plates, uh, aluminum plates in the bottom and so on to handle all the uh, various aerodynamic attachment devices. And about 10 days before, a letter came down from the board directors saying that all racing, both, was, I'm trying to think of how it was worded. It was to the effect that all racing, both overt and covert, will stop immediately. And so we couldn't, we never did. And I, it was a plaster model and I sent it to the paint shop and had it, picked out this orange and had it painted and put it in my office and that was it. <laughs> We never got any further with it than that. But these projects were, I, I don't know, to the outside observer may have seemed ridiculous and pointless and dreamy and all that. But it wasn't too many years until the oil crises came in in the 70s, is, you know, like a decade later, after this was done in 63. and 73, we had the first great oil crisis. And aerodynamics clearly became the way to go with automobile design to have an economical and very quick way of making, of making mileage change entirely from you know, 10, 12 miles to a gallon, which cars were getting then, or big cars were, luxury cars, to you know, closer to 20 and 30. My Riviera, for instance, gets 30 miles to the gallon on the road. And it's because you know it was it's aerodynamic enough that that it, it it it's it's effective. So stuff like this, while it's crazy and wild at the time you do it, uh, the insights that you get into aerodynamics are, are not completely useless. They might pop up to be very useful in in, in the future. Mm -hmm.